Caspar David Friedrich, sorry, Caspar David Friedrich is among the first romantic transcendental landscape artists. Now, transcendentalism is this idea that the man is tiny compared to the creation of the landscape. This is going to be a really important idea in the mid 19th century early to mid 19th century. So basically what you get are canvases where the human being is really, really small and the landscape is really, really big. It's focusing on God as creator rather than some kind of very close personal relationship with God. But at a larger, to a larger degree, it also reflects the idea that God exists more in nature than in any kind of man-made church or other edifice that could stand in his honor. So here, the landscape is a temple and the painting is an altarpiece to the temporary nature of man and the permanence and grandeur of nature. The divine is found outside of the confines of religion or any church. It's sort of a universal deism. In other words, God created things. God created the laws of the universe or the idea of William Blake and Jefferson and many others, and then step back and doesn't worry about the day-to-day -day interactions of humans or their lives. So it's their idea at the time. Now, there are also very strong Nazi connections between Friedrich and Hitler and not the kind you might think. Obviously, Friedrich is dead by the time Hitler is going to be coming into power, but Hitler, a former artist, actually he did watercolor paintings, and he was, of course, famously rejected from the art school at Dresden, looks up to Friedrich and believes that by the time we get to the 20th century, art is garbage and everyone should go back to this mid-19th century romantic style. So, what style is that? Well, let's look at the Abbey in Oak Forest, Abbey in the Oak Forest to get an idea what we're looking at. What we're seeing is the ruins of an abbey and really the ruins of life. The emblems of death are all around the image. The cross, the trees, the church. These are all symbols to the mortality of man. So here we have the cross, the trees, which appear to be dead, or maybe it's simply winter, the ruins of the church. The idea is that anything man-made will die, everything comes to an end, and this is a universal concept. This is something that goes beyond any edifice that we can build. It speaks to the mortality of man. This is no different than the memento mori that we saw in the Italian Renaissance. The idea that you constantly need a reminder of death. That way you kind of get off your butt and do the things that you're supposed to do. Change the society or alter the lives of those around you. We also get an incredible sense of scale, what appears to be a massive image. And we get that sense through the cross, through what appear to be gravestones and possibly people walking through the ruins. Again, that sense of transcendentalism, man being tiny within the grandeur of nature, but man also being very temporary within the grandeur of nature. Think about it this way, until well, probably until nuclear weapons and the combustion engine or whatever uh, manufacturing, etc., that altered the environment until the 20th century, we really didn't have the ability to permanently alter the earth. And there's some thought that we may not have that ability even now because the earth would heal after whatever happens. But at the time this is being painted, he's focusing on that idea of the earth, of creation being far greater than man. His concern is that man is getting, well, too full of himself. The divine here is symbolized by its creation, not the creations of man. So the church is in the way here rather than being the way. It's a very different way of looking at religion. He sees it as broken. He sees it as damaged. And this is an idea that exists in Europe at the time. And we're going to see it in paintings, but we're not only going to see it in European paintings. 
we'll see it in American paintings as well, although with a slightly different twist.